Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> good afternoon uh, and good morning to everyone, uh, depending on where you are in the world attending this. Um, today, I'll be getting into uh, a little bit around uh, Cassandra architecture um, and really, you know, hope, hopefully give everyone here a little bit more under, of an understanding around what's happening under the hood. Um, so you can start to make some, some better decisions around what's happening there. Um, so the first thing that we're going to cover is a very, very high level around um, the Cassandra architecture, uh, you know, how it's kind of structured, what that means for you. We'll then touch on um, tunable consistency, um, which is fundamental to the architecture of Apache Cassandra uh, and how that relates and how you can use those mechanisms uh, in your day to day job as a developer um, to kind of get things done and to achieve the goals you need to achieve. Uh, and then we'll also touch on um, a little bit of how Cassandra works under the hood when it comes to uh, the read and write path, right? So what's actually happening mechanically under the hood so you can get an understanding of how that might impact performance um, and how that might impact the way you go and build things. Um, but first, of course, um, a little bit around um, who InstaCluster is and who I am. Um, so I am the CTO and co-founder of, of InstaCluster. Um, we've been around um, coming up almost eight years now, um, doing lots and lots of cool fun stuff, uh, not only with Cassandra, um, but also with Kafka and Spark and Elasticsearch and, you know, all those really fun, highly available, highly scalable um, data infrastructure um, projects that, that um, you're probably familiar with. Um, and we just love to run those on behalf of you, right? So that's what we do. Um, we do manage services um, and databases as services around these. Uh, and we're also more than happy to support you in an on-premise environment. Um, again, I'll try and get into the meat of the content, um, but you know, here's just a very, very dense information, dense slide around what we do. Um, it is being recorded. So uh, if you want to learn more, please pause and have a read or go to our website. Um, so. So first of all, uh, why, why would you look into Cassandra, right? Um, so it tends to be, um, first and foremost, very low latency, um, you know, database. We're talking about single digit millisecond latency. Um, so great for high throughput data ingestion. Um, and you can nowadays um, also get some pretty solid read performance out of the back of it, right? Um, now, low latency is obviously a relative term. Um, you know, for example, if you're doing high frequency uh, trading or things that, you know, talk need nanoseconds, um, you know, you might want to look somewhere else. Uh, but for a modern day web app or microservices uh, architecture, um, you know, Cassandra is an awesome choice when it comes to the latency side of things. Um, it's incredibly scalable. And we'll get into how that kind of works a little bit in the architecture side of things. Um, but I think first and foremost, um, you know, it is incredibly reliable um, you know, database, right? So it certainly brings the concept of having replicas and redundancy uh, into the way you work as a first class citizen. Uh, and when you're building and structuring your queries, you're going to have to make some choices around that, right? But because you have to think about it up front, it makes for a much more stable and a much more reliable experience um, when you're running this in production. Um, so some of the key differences between, say, Apache Cassandra uh, and, a, and a traditional database. Um, you know, like a relational, a traditional relational database, I should say, um, is, well, the, the big one is the data model, right? Um, it, so Cassandra is a, a wide column um, storage engine, um, different to a columnar storage engine. Uh, and, you know, it kind of applies very much like a key, key value um, methodology to that. What that means from a data model perspective, though, is with relational, you tend to build um, a model that reflects real world entities and relationships. And then, you know, you start to normalize that, right? To build some efficiencies into your table, right? Uh, and then you <clears throat> will join data if you need, indexing for performance. You might do a few other things. Um, you might even denormalize for performance sometimes in relational databases as, as well, but generally you're trying to model those relationships, right? Um, whereas with Cassandra, um, you actually design based on the principle that, that write and data storage is incredibly cheap which it is nowadays. Um, and then, you know, you optimize your model based around how you want to retrieve the data. So you should be storing the data, uh, storing data in the way you're going to read it back, right? So that gives you those fast reads. It may mean you duplicate a little bit as well. But again, we're operating under the premise that storage is somewhat cheap. Uh, 
Um, Cassandra doesn't have um, much query capability in the terms of joins, right? Um, so again, by doing away with joins, um, we get the benefit of being able to be incredibly scalable, um, right? And it, and it allows and simplifies a number of things when it comes to, um, you know, having relationship consistency because we don't need to worry about it. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, you'll, you will see a few other restrictions around that. It does get a little bit um, interesting because the query language that Cassandra has um, is very, very similar to SQL, right? Um, in fact, deliberately so to make it easier for people to adopt Cassandra. Um, but it also on the flip side can be a little bit challenging because you may be used to doing things with SQL that won't work with Cassandra. Um, and so, you know, to cover what I just said previously, we've kind of got a little bit of like, here's what you could call the pros and the cons, right? Of choosing this database and every database will have it, right? So. Um, Cassandra on um, the, the the pro side, you know, it does get, it is highly available. It is um, you know masterless, and it does bring that that linear scalability, right? Um, but on the flip side, you do have a reduction in the flexibility when it comes to things like joins, right? Um, and so when it comes to the way that you think about Apache Cassandra, um, we'll just very quickly touch on um, a core. Uh, concept that's kind of needed to think about the way that Cassandra works. Um, and and um, that is the CAP theorem, right? Um, I won't go into it too much. Um, I'm sure most people who um, have, have looked at distributed databases are kind of at least loosely familiar with, um, with this theory. Um, but what it is, is that on any distributed system, um, it will generally exhibit three properties, right? Uh, sorry, it will be able to exhibit um, uh, three of oh, one of or two of these, um, I guess, uh, attributes, right? Um, some da databases will actually exhibit zero, which is interesting. Um, but the first one is consistency, which is every client has the same view of the data. Um, every re read receives the most recent write or an error, right? Uh, availability, every read or write request receives a response in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, and then partition tolerance. So the system continues to operate despite an arbitrary number of messages being dropped by the network, right? And generally, a distributed system will only be able to exhibit two of these attributes. Um, as, and, um, you know, Cassandra gives you a few options around um, how, how you play within this particular space. Um, so in a, and so one other thing to remember about this is, you know, how do you think about this when it comes to failure models, right? Because this is a, a way of describing how failures happen. Um, so in a distributed system, network fa failures, um, we tend to assume they always occur. Um, so one would argue that you need to be partition tolerant, right? Um, and so with CAP theorem, you need to choose generally between, um, you know, uh, CP or AP. Right, so um, consistent and partition tolerant or available and partition tolerant. It's really hard to have all of it, right? Or impossible, right? Um, with Cassandra, you can have the balance. Uh, you can balance the level of consistency and the level of availability, right? So that's what we call tunable consistency. So on a per query basis, we can actually change the constraints of the query to favor either, you know, um, a consistent and partition tolerant um, a database or a highly available and partition tolerant database. Um, but the way that you'll see most Cassandra deployments is, it, is that it favors AP. Um, and, and here's another example of the way this works with Cassandra. Um, we'll get into what some of these terms mean in a second. Um, but on a per query basis, you're able to choose, uh, for example, how many replicas respond to a given um, query. And you can do that on a per query basis. Um, and so you can either ask for all of the, the replicas to respond. Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and, uh, you know, if you choose all of the replicas, that will be a highly consistent query. Um, however, if any one of those replicas is down, you then lose the availability. On the other side of it, you can then ask for, hey, just give me one answer of the given replica. Um, and you know that means you can sustain multiple uh, replicas being down. However, you know um, the response might not be consistent with the most recent write, 
There are two consistency levers that you can kind of play with here, right? Um, one is the replication factor. So that is the number of copies of a row that Cassandra will store on a number of different replicas. Um, and this is determined uh, at schema definition, right? And then you've got the consistency level. So that's on a per query basis, the number of replicas that must respond or answer a query um, whenever you issue it, right? Um, and so again, because you can change and play with that, um, that's where you give have that, that tunable consistency. So this is what a Cassandra database uh, generally looks like from a high level architectural perspective, right? Um, you have this concept of uh, a node. Um, a node is uh, a single server or a single instance or a single you know, JVM, right? So it's a single logical instance of Cassandra um, running. Uh, uh, Cassandra has a, um, a masterless architecture, right? So that means every single node is equal. Uh, and is capable of serving any given request, right? However, each node will only own a, a portion of the data and we'll kind of show you how that works in a little bit. Uh, and then on top of that, Cassandra has, um, you know, some really, really great awareness of the topology in which it's been deployed into, right? So you can tell Cassandra uh, like what rack in a data center it's been placed in, what data center it's been placed in, um, on the cloud side of things, you know, you can say what availability zone it's been placed in, what region it's been placed in. Uh, and then Cassandra will actually place replicas um, in a manner where, you know, each replica is in a different value domain, right? So it'll, you know, within a single data center, if you ask for a replication factor of say three, um, it'll go and make sure that it's placing each one of those replicas in a different rack. So if that entire rack goes down, right? So <clears throat> let's say you have, you know, a top of switch failure or, you know, a networking cable to that rack goes, um, you know, then you're gonna have your replicas in those other racks, right? It won't be placing all those replicas in three servers within that single rack, right? Um, so some great flexibility when it comes to, uh, you know, how you structure your availability. Uh, and this is just a really, really nice example of that, right? Um, and so see here down the bottom, we've got data center one, our replication factor there is three, right? So if we look at our table across here, um, you know, we've got, uh, you know, that first row with the name of Alice. Um, well, the record for that is going to be placed um, along three different uh, nodes within that particular data center. And then we've got a replication factor of one in the other data center. Um, and, you know, so we're only placing one replica there, right? Um, and so the number of replicas that must, uh, as I mentioned before, we've got the consistency level, right? So that will tell us how many of these different nodes back um, on the previous page that I showed you um, will actually respond to a request, right? Um, and again, always remember consistency level can be configured on a per request basis um, and the consistency level is a client or application property, right? So that's something you specify on the query um, and it's on a per query basis. There are a number of different uh, consistency levels that you can choose from when you go to build your query. Um, and again, this is purely based on the requirements that you have for, um, you know, how, how available or how consistent you need your application to be. Right, so at the top, the most consistent, we've got all, and then all the way down the bottom is any, which is just, hey, any, any replica can respond to this, right? What we tend to see is that most people choose quorum, um, and quorum is kind of a shorthand for saying, um, I need a majority of replicas. This, what is the smallest majority of replicas that will respond to uh, my particular query, right? Um, so what that means is that with quorum, we can potentially start to construct some ideas or um, a theory around how do we build strong consistency, but potentially still have one or two nodes go down, right? Um, and so Cassandra brings in this concept of what's called strong consistency. Uh, and that's where the consistency level um, or the so of of read of the read that you do plus the consistency level of the write that you do, and what I mean when I say plus 
we're talking about the number of replicas that must respond. So, um, you know, for the reads, if we say we've got a replication factor of three, um, but on the read side, we say, hey, we need at least two to respond. Plus on the right side, we say we need another two to at least respond. As long as that is greater than the replication factor, we will actually guarantee that we always get, um, we, we always query a node that has the most up-to-date previous write, right? So that ticks that box, box for consistency, right? Going back to the CAP theorem, we got CP as a property that we might want to get because we want a consistent view of the data in our database. Um, but again, because we're kind of relying on this overlap, right? Um, what we can do is we can also then get a little bit of that high availability and sustain uh, any particular outages that we might have, right? And so this is a great example, right? So we've got on the bottom left of the screen here, you can see the client performs a write to Cassandra. <clears throat> that write goes to three nodes, right? Um, and, you know, it could even potentially have, let's have a look on um, the, the right-hand side. If that write only succeeds on two out of those three nodes, even though we're telling Cassandra to distribute to at least three nodes, but something goes wrong, um, and then we issue a read, then you can see how, because we've got that overlap, right? Um, you know, we're gonna have a strongly consistent answer because we're including at least one of those nodes that has that particular write. Um, I'll just pause here because we do have one question that has, has come through uh, in the chat. Um, and that is, uh, so what are the applications of Cassandra? Um, that is a very good, but also broad ranging question. Um, so fundamentally it comes down to um, what are things that you would generally see um, a normal relational database handle on the transactional side? That's where I'd say you've got a good, good scope to have a look at Cassandra. If you've got the requirements to be highly available or highly scalable. Um, there's probably a, um, a better, way of also looking at this, which is what are some things that Cassandra is not great for? Uh, and there's definitely some things that it is not good at. Um, I would definitely not use it as a primary analytics data store, right? Um, you know, you're much better off using, um, you know, look, let's go throw some Parquet files up in S3, right? Uh, or HDFS if, you know, you live in that particular world. Um, as a graph database, um, there are some graph capabilities built on top of it. Um, for a scale out, you know, graph database, I'm thinking of things like, you know, Titan DB, um, which do leverage Cassandra to do that. Um, you know, and so that's certainly, you know, useful um, from a real time graph perspective. Um, but at the, the flip side, you know, I tend to point people towards, well, hey, if you're going to do graph stuff, graph traversals, graph analytics, whatever that kind of stuff is, you know, you're better off looking at something that's largely in memory and just buying a really big machine to do that. Um, it tends to be a heck of a lot quicker. Uh, and, I, and that's because graph relationships are, you know, highly linked, right? Which can break down a little bit from a performance perspective um, in a scale out architecture. That's not to say you can't do it. it you know, it's just, there's some trade-offs involved. But great question, thanks. So we've talked a lot about consistency. We've talked a lot about um, how Cassandra will do different placements um, based on, you know, what rack, what availability zone you're in, um, all that kind of fun stuff. Um, but some of you might be thinking, well, that's that's all well and good, right? But how, how does Cassandra, you know, actually split the data up, right? Because in order to scale out, as you add more nodes, you don't want eat every single one of those nodes to own all the data, right? Because, you know, you're, yes, you're increasing your availability, you're increasing your durability, um, but, you know, you're not actually um, increasing the number of resources per gigabyte of data that you're stored, right? Which is how you kind of scale up that capability. Um, and so what <coughs> Cassandra does is it actually splits up the data set um, and stores only a portion of it on each node, right? Now, each node is capable of serving any requ um, particular request, but some of those requests may end up being routed to other nodes that actually own the data. So how does Cassandra um, know or allocate where that data lives? 
And how does it do it in a way that's easy or, or cheap to kind of look up, right? Um, and, and that comes really down to hashing, right? Um, so at the end of the day, Cassandra is actually like a distributed um, hash map, right? Um, it has a hashing function. Um, you pass data into it and it says, spits it out and says, this is where it lives, right? Here's the bucket within my map that it lives. Um, and you might be thinking, well, what's a, what's, a ha what's a hash function if you haven't you know, done much in this particular space, right? Um, so it's a mathematical function um, that can be used to map data of any arbitrary size to fixed size values, right? Um, and there are a number of other properties that a lot of people find very useful around hashing, um, either from a security perspective, a randomness perspective, a distribution perspective, a speed perspective. I won't get into that. Um, but the thing you need to know for today is that a hash function, you pass in any blo like blob of data, it does some maths on it, and then it spits out a fixed size value. Um, <clears throat> and in the case, Cassandra uses the MERMA3 hash, which tends to guarantee that um, the distribution um, will be somewhat random, right? So if I take a big, large blob, let's say, you know, it's one megabyte long and I hash that with MERMA3, it'll spit out one number. If I just change a single bit, it will spit out a wildly different number as well, right? So we can get some great distribution around there and that's how we evenly distribute data around, um, around Cassandra. Uh, and so within that, <clears throat> let's have a look, little bit of a look around uh, an example. Uh, and one thing I will say as well, um, so with, with the hashing function, um, each Cassandra node will actually own a proportion um, of what we call the, um, the hashes address space, right? Um, so um, if we have a, uh, a hash function, um, it, ta it, it takes, it's a consistent hash, it takes a value and it spits out a number between one and nine, right? What we can do is we can actually say, well, we know that the entire address space of this hash function, there's only nine numbers, right? So let's actually allocate those and say, okay, the first node in our Cassandra cluster, right? Uh, that's gonna own between one and three, right? So any value that hashes to that, that'll end up living on node one, right? Node two, Anything between four and six, that lives on node two, right? Same with seven to nine, lives on node three. Let's apply our, our consistent hash function, right? Um, so we hash the value Alice, that row ends up living on node three, wonderful, right? We end up doing a consistent hash of Bob, that ends up living on node one, right? The great thing about this particular scheme is that the client, the driver, the client application can actually um, hash a query before it sends it to Cassandra. And as long as it knows this, this um, the mapping of which nodes own which particular um, you know, addresses or tokens within the address space, um, it knows that it just, uh, it, it knows that it can send a query to a particular node um, and that node will have the data and it doesn't have to do any lookups. It doesn't have to ask all the nodes within the cluster, hey, who's got this data? So it makes it for a really, really efficient scheme. And this consistent hashing approach is also where Cassandra gets its ability to um, scale up in a linear fashion, right? Uh, and, and this is probably one of the most powerful um, things about this concept of consistent hashing uh, and the address space right, um, is what we can do is we can actually take our three node cluster, right, and if we decide to add another uh, six nodes to it, right, what we can do is we divide up that hash space, right, so again, whereas uh, node one used to own one, two, and three, it now has uh, node one just only owns one, and it gave up ownership of its range to, um, node two, node three, right? These additional nodes that we added in there. What that means is if you've equally sized all your servers, is you've now got more resources applied to a smaller proportion of that hash space, right? So you've got more resources serving a smaller proportion of your data set, right? And that's how you get linear scalability. So how does hashing and replication factor interact, 
right? So, you know, I've talked a lot about, well, hey, this one node now owns, right, this particular row. What happens or how does that work with the replication factor of three, right? We know how to hash a value. We know how to figure out which node it should live on, but what happens when it's like, well, hey, we need three copies of this, right? Um, what Cassandra does um, is it works out the consistent hash on it. And then it just looks at, well, hey, what's the next node that owns the next logical token um, along? And what we're going to do is we're actually going to put the replica for that data on that node, right? So all it needs to do is go clockwise around the ring uh, and, it, and it fills up each next node until it satisfied the replication factor. And this works for a replication factor of three. It works for a replication factor of five, whatever that might be. It just goes clockwise around the ring and because we know who owns what hash space or, or what, what token space, we then also know where to look up any given particular replica um, or, or owner of a given piece of data, right? Um, I'll pause here for a second. Um, we kind of covered some very heavy uh, concepts uh, and I'll answer a few questions, right? Um, so we've had someone uh, uh, ask, what is the relationship between Apache Hadoop, HBase, Hive and Cassandra? Um, so this one's pretty easy to, um, here, let me, sorry, I'm just figuring out how to actually <laughs> you Zoom and answer questions. Um, so yeah, the relationship between Hadoop, HBase, Hive, and Cassandra. Um, there's actually no relationship between them other than what I would say is they are big data technologies and they all live under the Apache Foundation. Um, HBase and Hive are very much components of uh, the Hadoop ecosystem. Um, Hive is probably the most similar to Cassandra. Um, it is a, um, you know, a, a scale out database. Um, however, it does focus on being consistent and um, partition tolerant. It is not incredibly highly available. Um, there are some things you can do that can help out with that. Um, it also largely runs on top of HDFS um, as well. Now that is me going off knowledge about uh, Apache Hive from two or three years ago. So um, if anyone, knows far more about it and that has since changed. I deeply apologize. Uh, and then Hadoop, um, you know, it's essentially a, you know, it's a MapReduce framework, right? So it's about crunching uh, a lot of data across a lot of nodes. Um, whereas again, Cassandra is more focused on the transactional data storage layer. Uh, someone has just, oh, someone has just asked, uh, does Cassandra work on Windows? Kinda. Um, so it does, so I believe from Cassandra 2.1 or 2.2, um, there has been first class support for uh, Windows. However, um, I believe with the, with the new rele upcoming release of Cassandra 4.0, um, Windows support may is likely to be deprecated. Um, I think just within the community, we haven't seen a ton of support or interest in, um, or, or large production users running it on, on Windows. It certainly does work, and but there's a few kind of gnarly bits around keeping it compatible. Um, but I think most importantly is, um, uh, so WSL um, Windows system for Linux, the Linux compatibility layer. Um, we've seen a lot of uh, developers um, actually use Cassandra with that, um, with, with some great success. Um, WSL one uh, was a little bit gnarly when it came to the performance side of it. Um, it. It wasn't particularly high performance on the IO side. I believe WSL two um, is is a lot better at that. Um, but but yeah, no, Cassandra is very much it. It lives and breathes in, in the Linux space. Um, but you can get it working on on Windows. All right, uh, we'll do. Uh, we'll do just two more questions uh, and then I'll get back into it. Um, <clears throat> so here's one. Uh, so since the data uh, is just distributed by hashing, would it be bad, a bad use case to use Cassandra for a data set that is ordered? Um, it seems like there would be a lot of network traffic in that scenario since you would be hitting a lot of different nodes, which you could be avoided, could be avoided using a different technology. Uh, that is a really, really good question, right? So, um, in the, so Cassandra actually supports the concept of pluggable hashing mechanisms, right? 
Um, and uh, I believe, uh, I, I think it, it, it got deprecated or, or unsupported, um, but there is actually a consistent order hashing mechanism um, that you can apply to Apache Cassandra, right? So you can guarantee that your table will actually be in order or stored in order around the ring. Um, <clears throat> there are a lot of downsides with doing that um, with most use cases that actually ended up, we ended up seeing Cassandra get deployed for. Um, because it is consistently ordering that, um, you tend to see a lot of hotspots, right? So for example, if you um, were hashing on um, a primary key value of, of name, right? For example, um, you would start to see hotspots, you know, trending for different names that were popular in different geographical locations, right? Um, you know, so for example, if you had uh, you know, a, a largely Western focused um, user base, um, you know, you might see, you know, lots of like Rebecca's and John's and, um, you know, Dave's, for example, right? Um, in other locations, you know, you might see lots of like Muhammad's, for example. Um, and so what that means is because of that, con that consistent ordering, it makes it really good to kind of um, scan the entire table around the ring, it makes it very easy but there would be one or two nodes that just had way too much data compared to the other ones, right? So um, that certainly made it, made it challenging. Um, and then to page through an entire table, if it's ordered randomly, um, you know, you definitely, it, it, you can do it efficiently, like it'll only hit each particular record once. Um, but yes, it's, it, the problem then is it's out of order. Um, the other thing as well is if you're doing lots of those full table scans, um, the way that you query, because it's, it's, it's request response, it's like, hey, give me this one thing. Hey, give me this one thing. And, you know, you can do some optimizations and you can say, hey, give me all the, you know, all the rows with, within this token space. That makes it a little bit more efficient. But Cassandra is not really designed, um, you know, to, to be, um, you know, kind of that, that full query, oh, sorry, that full analytics capability where you're scanning the entire table, right? So there's a lot of inefficiencies on the read side. We'll get into that in a sec about why that's not a particularly good idea. So long question, a long answer, the short version of that um, is, you know, if you needed a, an ordered data set, like the entire table was ordered, not just components within that, and you needed to query the entire table um, often, I probably wouldn't look at Cassandra for that. Uh, and then the last question I'll answer, there are more coming in, but we'll kind of deal with those a little bit um, later, is C Cassandra demands a schema, I guess. Um, can it fit variable schemas in the same table? So yes, Cassandra is um, a schema-based database. In the past, it was a schema-less um, database, right? Um, however, I think very wisely, a lot of folk in the project you know, decided to implement a schema. It makes it a little bit easier to do a number of things from a data science perspective. Uh, but importantly, um, you know, whether you define a schema logically or formally, um, or you don't, there is an inherent or an implied schema, right? Having said that, there are a number of schemas where there is a certain amount of flexibility around, you know, um, for example, different properties things can have. Uh, and, you know, you see that in document models and that kind of thing. Um, you can model. Um, you know, flexible things like that within within Cassandra, it, it is very doable, but you will be defining a schema upfront anyway that allows you to do that. But great question. Cool, so going on, um, we'll try and get through this very, very quickly because um, we do have a little bit to cover <laughs> at the end and I've only got a few more minutes. Um, this is what multi-DC replication also looks like, right? So, you know, exact same thing. Um, it just, you know, it's, it sends that right off to the other, uh, the other DC. The other DC lives in the same um, hashing address space. So you're not talking about two different spaces, um, but Cassandra will kind of interleave those um, for you and then understand which DCs um, are where. Um, so here's an example of a number of different consistency levels, right? This is a consistency level of one. We've got that central node being the coordinator node. Uh, and it only needs one response, right? We can see that there. Um, and you can see here that if one of those nodes fails, 
we're still getting a response. We're getting at least one response from those other nodes. Sweet, so our query succeeds. Consistency level of all, <clears throat> we send a query. Hey, we get a response from all those replicas. Wonderful, that query succeeds. As soon as one of those fails, the whole query fails. Uh, and this is quorum as well, right? Um, so if you remember um, from before, quorum is the smallest possible majority within um, you know, the replication factor, or you can think of it as um, you know, divide the replication factor in half, uh, round down, then add one, right? So we still got a success there, right? Awesome. So that's a very, very, very quick high level view of Cassandra's <coughs> um, uh, partitioning, the consistency levels that it has. Um, and let's get a little bit into the, the, the read and write path, right? Um, and I think what has probably come up in uh, some of my questions that I have answered um, is there's this overwhelming theme that, that you kind of need to be a little bit mechanically sympathetic to Cassandra, right? Um, and that was really illustrated by that previous question around, well, hey, what about if I've got some data that's ordered, right? Is Cassandra a good choice for that? Um, and, you know, really you need to be thinking around what is Cassandra good at? What is its strengths, right? Um, and, and picking or designing your data model towards those strengths, right? You know, it's not like a relational database where you just describe the relationships um, and kind of just hope it keeps on working and then maybe do a few indexes um, to kind of help things out. Um, but Cassandra, you really got to be thinking about the way it behaves um, up front, right? So in terms of, you know, what does a single write look like? Um, we've kind of covered what that looks like from a broad systems perspective, right? So it hits coordinator node um, and, you know, it looks at which, you know, token space it, be it, it belongs to, uh, and then it'll go and you know, route that query to the other replicas if it needs to. Um, but what does it actually look like on the node itself, right? Um, so <clears throat> on the, uh, the right path, um, we have this concept of a commit log, right? So the commit log is the very, very, very first thing that Cassandra will put the data in before it does anything else, right? As long as it's the owner for that particular <laughs> uh, query. Um, and what it is, is it's essentially like the same as write ahead log in Postgres, a journal, a transaction log, whatever you might call it. So saying, hey, I received this. If anything goes wrong while I'm processing and figuring out what to do with it, and I have to reboot or restart, I can replay this from my commit log, right? So the first thing, as soon as the client inserts or writes a piece of data, Cassandra is going to grab that, coordinated node is going to write, wicked, I'm going to throw that in my commit log. Um, <clears throat> Cassandra will flush that commit log periodically, by default, every 20 seconds, I believe. Um, there's a number of databases out there that will actually f-sync every single write um, on their commit log. So they make sure it's persisted to disk. Cassandra can be play a little bit looser with that because again, it's making the bet that there's also another node or another two nodes or another three nodes that are also getting that write and the, is going to persist that to their commit logs as well, right? So. Um, you've got a little bit of flexibility in that as well, and so you're not having to f-sync every single every single um, write. Um, the next thing uh, that the node will will do, and again, this is all about persisting it to the local node it, it itself. So you've already got the coordinator layer sending off the writes to the other nodes as well. That's already kind of happened, um, <clears throat> and it will then insert that write into a mem table, right? So um, it's essentially in-memory storage for writes. Um, all writes will go to the mem table after being written to the commit log. Um, and you could argue and I, I, I act somewhat as, as a cache, um, but it's essentially, it's just the primary um, data structure that Cassandra has to operate on data in memory, right? Um, what will happen then is <clears throat> it will only be able to keep a certain number of those mem tables uh, in, in memory, right? You know, because um, you know, memory is more expensive than disk. Um, and what'll happen is once it reaches a pre-configured threshold, it'll flush or it'll take that mem table and write it to, debt, to disk, right? Um, and that mem table, when it's written to disk, it's called an SS table. It's the exact same data structure. It's just the SS table is the um, kind of preserved or stored 
in-memory representation on disk. SS, um, I believe that stands for sorted string table. Um, and there's a number of other mechanisms as well that Cassandra has both in memory and on disk. And they're largely there to try and reduce, um, you know, the, the total time it takes to serve a particular query, right? Sorry for interrupting, but we have five minutes left. Wonderful, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I'll jump through this super duper quickly um, as, as well. Um, luckily, because I've been answering questions throughout the session, um, we, we won't have to do too many questions at the end. Um, and so this is the SS table, which I just described before. Um, keep in mind, so most importantly, um, it never gets modified. Once it's written to disk, it never gets modified. However, um, it can be deleted or it can be merged with another SS table, right? Um, and then, so that's, so under the hood, all these SS tables form a merge, uh, merge structured, uh, uh, sorry, a merge uh, log tree, right? I might be getting that a little bit wrong, um, but essentially what it means is that in order to, um, you know, kind of write and persist data, it has all, the, all these SS tables and it can only like merge or um, delete them, right? Um, and so we'll kind of get into how that also impacts on the read side in a little bit. As I mentioned, um, these SS tables can get merged. A lot of them will get flushed from memory onto disk. So you can end up with like a lot of small ones. You can end up with, with ones where um, a particular row might be updated, um, say a few hours ago, that's in one SS table, then it gets updated again. And then that update is in another SS table, right? So Cassandra has this process called compaction where it merges those SS tables together so that it can try and keep as many of um, you know, those rows in the same SS table as well, which makes for way more efficient reads. So on the read side of things, um, again, we've got that same um, high level architectural process. Uh, so that same high level distributed process that happens, the client sends a request to a co coordinator, works out what the, um, uh, what particular token or what, what node owns that. And then it sends that request onto that. The coordinator may also be that particular one, right? Um, what will happen then is it's got a number of caches um, that will first check, right? Um, it also uses some bloom filters to figure out where, you know, those keys might actually be either in the caches or um, on disk. Uh, and then it tries and fulfills that particular request, right? Um, the <clears throat> partition, um, you know, uh, summary um, is what's used um, as well as the index to locate data on disk. So first it checks all the stuff in memory, right? So we're talking about mem tables, the row cache if it's enabled um, and any, and then potentially the key cache, um, but then it'll look at the partition summaries and indexes on disk to try and figure out where, where it lives. Um, we'll jump through this a little bit more. Um, the key cache is potentially useful. It is what it sounds like. Um, it makes lookups a little bit faster and it kind of keeps those hot um, keys in memory. Uh, and then a row cache is actually storing essentially the result of the entire query, which is really great if you have a lot of queries that are the same and hitting the same node time and time again. Um, and as I mentioned, a bloom filter, um, it is essentially a data structure that allows you to um, work out whether something may be in a given set and it does it in a very efficient manner. Cool, so we kind of got to the end here. I know I'm almost out of time. Uh, I've got kind of like 20 seconds. Um, I think the key takeaways, there are a number um, from this particular talk um, around the technicalities, um, but the main one is get an understanding of the way that Cassandra works under the hood. It is a database that requires a good degree of mechanical sympathy, um, but once you kind of understand that and you can build your data model around that, um, you kind of have this rock solid bulletproof scalable database, um, you know, that can kind of take you from 10 nodes all the way to 1,000. So thank you all very much um, for, for coming today. Um, it's been really wonderful to answer some of those questions, some wonderful questions.